By now, many of you are aware of just how exactly the PCLM marking scheme is applied to your essays. And the purpose of today's podcast is to help you write an essay that will best target the requirements of that marking scheme. If you'd like to have a look at a more detailed overview of the PCLM marking scheme, we have a short video on the Institute website and I'd invite you to do so. So, just a very quick recap on what PC, L and M stand for. P stands for the purpose, that's your question, and it's worth 30% of the marks, but importantly, you can never score a higher mark than the mark you achieve for P. So it's very important that you keep the question to the forefront of your thoughts at all times. C is the cohesiveness of your response. L is the language in your essay. And M is 10%, that's your spelling and grammar. Now, how do you actually write an essay that best targets the PCLM marking scheme? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that the question that you're going to meet in June will have three parts to it. However, only two of those parts will be coded, but you must deal with all three parts of it. Now, by coded, what I mean is that the correctors are given two separate codes that kind of encapsulate what the question is asking you to do. If we take this question, for example, Platz, provocative imagery, serves to highlight the intense emotions in her poetry. The most likely coding that you would see for that type of question would be code PI for provocative imagery and code IE for intense emotions. But you need to deal with all three parts of that question. The best way to understand what a question is actually asking you to do is to write down on top of the question the words how, why, what, and to a certain extent where. So before I'd ever start to look at that essay, I'd say to myself, well, how does Platt's provocative imagery highlight intense emotions in her poetry? Where do we see these intense emotions? Why are they intense? Why is the imagery provocative? How does it do it? How does it highlight intense emotions, etc.? Now, frequently I will tell my students when you're preparing for the exam to look out for what I call the 3 percenter word. 3% roughly of the population in the old grades gets an A1. We're not sure yet because nobody has done the new exam in terms of the new grading, how many um, people will achieve a H1 grade. But 3% of the, the population get an A1. And only 3% will see these very important words, which to other students may appear hidden or unimportant. And one way to recognize them is, if you can take the word out of the question and it still makes sense, well then it's a very important question word. So in this essay, I would say provocative is an interesting word to look at because you could, the setter who wrote that question could have said, Platt's imagery serves to highlight intense emotions in her poetry. But he or she chose to put in the word provocative. So I'd look at that, not ignore it, I'd deal with it. Now, how do you write an essay? How do you put together an effective essay to deal with such a question? The first thing to bear in mind is that the marks you get for P will be largely determined by the quantity and certainly the quality of the coding that you manage to produce or that the corrector awards you on the day of the exam. So it's very important that you target the codes. You'll receive a code for a developed point. Therefore, it is my advice to you not to give too much time to your introduction. You need an introduction because of the cohesiveness of your essay needs one, the structure of your essay needs an introduction, but don't spend too much time on it. Importantly, and I really want to stress this, there is no requirement in the marking scheme for you to demonstrate in your essay proof of planning. That is not there, but we want to make sure our essay looks like a planned response to the question that's asked. Similarly, I would advise against listing, before you start to write your main body paragraphs, all the poems that you're going to discuss. Because what you've done there is possibly two dangerous things in terms of your essay. Firstly, you've straight jacked yourself in terms of the question. You've said, I'm going to deliver a response to this question with the following five poems in mind. You may not, under the stress of the exam, get to cover all five poems and then your introduction is really destabilizing the structure of your essay so something that was never going to get you that many marks could actually lose you marks secondly if you fail to put the titles of the poems in inverted commas you will lose one mark under the punctuation marks of l so therefore before you even start you could be down four three five marks depending how many poems you mentioned so let's turn our attention now to the main body paragraph 
your first main body paragraph. In order to effectively target the codes available, I would suggest that in your approach that you develop a topic sen sentence sequence, what I call a topic sentence sequence. Now a topic sentence sequence can work like this. As you initiate the essay, make a broad question-based statement. So that's step one. Step two, drill down a little bit further. Target a little bit more specifically what exactly you're speaking about in terms of the question. What aspect of the question is this paragraph going to deal with? And then thirdly, introduce your content. So the question we're looking at today is, Plath makes effective use of provocative imagery to highlight the intense emotions in her poetry. So a topic sentence sequence that might target the question in a meaningful way might look like this. Plath has a, meaning, has a masterful poetic style. So that's a broad based statement. It's a holding statement and it's not really doing much. It's just settling me down and getting me ready for a more drill down statement that targets the question. So two, in particular, she frequently relies on aural imagery in order to highlight the emotional intensity in her poems. Now that's a far more specific sentence that is saying to the creator, I'm going to look at this question from the point of view of aural imagery. Now begins my content phase. This aural quality of Platt's poetry can be both mesmerising and unsettling. In Morning Song, one of the most uplifting Platt poems on our course, Platt makes use of a series of aural images in order to convey a joyful message. And now the content phase rolls out with support. The jaunty rhythm of love sets you going like a fat gold watch gives way to an awestruck, reverential tone when Platt likens her baby to a new statue in a drafty museum. These two similes capture the intense joy and awe that Plath is experiencing. Notice how I'm using a lot of the language of poetry now in order to pick up those L marks, rhythm, tone, simile. And now I'll go on with the content phase. This imagery, and I'll use a question word, is further strengthened by her use of assonance. The broad vowel sounds contained in ah and ooh mimic the baby talk of the new parents and allow the reader to share in the joy that Plath is experiencing. Furthermore, the delicate sound created by the onomatopoeia in such lines as your moth breath flickers helps us to appreciate more fully the tender nature of an image that seeks to highlight just how intense the mother's concern is. And that's my final sentence of that paragraph. And notice how in the final sentence, I repeat some of the key question words. So to kind of summarize that paragraph, I started off with a topic sentence sequence one broad sentence, two more specific, three introduced content. During the content phase of my essay, I made sure that I used the language of poetry. Rhythm, tone, similes, assonance, and onomatopoeia all appeared in my paragraph. I quoted three to four times in order to give strength to my points, and I helped the corrector give me the necessary codes by using those question words. My next paragraph is going to follow exactly the same pattern but it will link to the previous paragraph. That's very important if I want to maintain the structural cohesion of my essay. Easy links include words like however, nevertheless, although, and a more complex link is where you link through content. So I'm going to have a look at that now. However, the imagery in Platt's poetry can be as disturbing as it is beautiful. So I've linked back to the content of the previous paragraph. It's also a broad-based sentence following the same one, two, three-stepped approach. In Child, for example, the poet uses a number of images that rely on assonance to capture the sound of a child's speech. I want to fill it with the colour and ducks and zoo of the new. It's a block quotation there, as you'll see from the essay which we've made available for you on the website. However, in the final stanza of the poem, Plath uses assonance to provoke much darker emotions. The repetition of broad vowel sounds contained in the image of a dark ceiling without a star creates and always say what the image does. Never explain the image, say what it does. An intensely brooding, gloomy atmosphere that highlights the depressed emotions experienced by the speaker. And a similar effect can be seen in poppies in July. Here the image of the poppies is enhanced by a number of language techniques that provoke intense emotions. And notice here now, the middle phase of my paragraph, I'm including the question. And on I go, as you can see when you read the essay. My essay for a poetry, unseen poetry, or a seen poetry question rather, would 
lies somewhere in the region of about 1,000, 1,200 words. That's about four to five pages of exam booklet. Um, you'd have four to five paragraphs, although there's no rule about this, and you'd make sure that you would target those question words in every single paragraph. Importantly, there's no requirement on you anymore to produce a personal response. I still see students being told that they have to have a personal response. The only thing you have to have in the essay is an answer to the question. Personal engagement is always uh, nice to show, but it's certainly not necessary. So you'd move on through your essay, down to your final paragraph, down to your conclusion. The conclusion, importantly, shouldn't contain any new information. It should mirror the introduction, and anybody reading it, as with your introduction, should be able to see clearly it is a conclusion to that question. So I hope you found that helpful. I think if you're listening to this, it would be really, really useful for you to have the essay um, that we've made available on the website in front of you and to read through it. And I'd welcome any comments. Thank you.